So uh, next, uh, uh, maybe about 30 to 40 minutes, I want to talk about the uh, just a global uh, disaster and how we uh, re reconstruction and how we can actually uh, reduce risk. But just a little bit about company. Uh, we are located in a five, uh, well, four different continents, and uh, from Europe to the uh, uh, to the uh, Haiti to just everywhere. But you can see it. We are located in a, along the Soko Rainbow Fire. That's where we are. In the past uh, 40 years, we respond to to over 100 different uh, earthquake disasters, and not only we just respond to uh, collect the data, but also we actively participate in actual recovery, reconstruction itself. And in many cases, we stay longer to actually reduce the risk in a country or uh, cities. That's why it's best what we do. Personally, after 2010 Haiti earthquake, um, 1907, which killed the, uh, almost uh, 300,000 people, I was living in Haiti for almost full-time based for about three years. And Nepal earthquake in 2015, which also killed about 10,000 people, uh, I, I was living there for about a year and a half. And uh, our teams are still there to actually be being a part of our Soko country teams. So this is a picture uh, I took in 2010. It's a downtown port of Prince. It was a, uh, it was the one of our most, I would say, incredible disaster human ever faced. You know, it uh, killed about 300,000 people, destroyed about 250,000 buildings, and uh, made 1.2 million people homeless. The reason is such a huge impact was not only just that the uh, Port-au-Prince was close to Epicenter, it's only 15, about 10 to 15 uh, kilometers away, but also the construction itself. There's something that uh, uh, you see typically out there. It's not really good concrete mixture you can see, and the way the, uh, the actual design of it, or per se the concept of construction itself, is what we call confined dimension. If it's done right, actually, the, uh, those buildings could perform well, but however, it's not done right because earthquake was not something Haiti was never expected. So therefore, yet there is no concept of the earthquake, say engineering per se. So therefore, the construction itself is not really good at all. I mean, for this kind of building, it may perform okay for hurricanes because pretty heavy concrete construction. But once it comes to earthquake shaking, it doesn't quite work out. Because of that, the human impacts are tremendous. 1.2 million people, they, left, uh, they lost their homes, and the condition was not nice. I mean, essentially, people stuck like that for many, many months. So the first thing we did was the, uh, we worked with the MTPTC, that's a, a Ministry of Public Works uh, in the Haitian government. And this, uh, these works are funded by many different agencies from a World Bank, to a U.S. aid, to the uh, uh, many other um, uh, no, non-profit uh, agencies. So we uh, worked with about uh, 700 engineers in Haiti, and uh, uh, we developed the uh, whole system for damage assessment because that's the the one thing is most critical part of it of a reconstruction or response components is to really understand that. Uh, what happened to the city, what happened to the region. So that's the first thing you need to do. So essentially, that we trained 700 engineers. We had the around 420,000 objects or houses or buildings up there, everywhere. It's essentially, it's a house by house operation. It was a pretty amazing, I must say. I mean, I must have lost, when I was doing this thing, I was one of the team leaders. Uh, probably, I don't know, 20 pounds, you know, just, just up and down the hill over this port of Prince for, uh, took us good one year. But Haitian engineers, they're actually uh, uh, fantastic people, you know, they, uh, they are really due diligent and uh, they work hard, intelligent, and um, um, it's just that they do this all, essentially. So here you can see uh, what happened to the uh, actual town itself. There you go. So uh, we tagged, we assessed about 420,000 buildings, and uh, what we discovered is pretty interesting. 
as bad as the uh, disaster was, about 50% of buildings, which is uh, almost 200, well, about 250,000 buildings, they're damaged, but 250, about half of the buildings, almost 200,000 buildings, they are green tags, which means the uh, um, be able to occupy it. Its damage is very limited to nothing, which is actually the big discoveries. So the people who left the home because they're scared, they could actually come back because there was an original state. And but also at the same time, there's the uh, about uh, about 240,000 damaged buildings. Out of that, around 100, about 100, about half half, about 100,000 buildings. There are red tags, which means either collapsed or heavily damaged, and it's very difficult to fix. But same time, we discovered about 100,000 of them. About 20 to 30 percent of building stocks, they're what we call yellow tagged, which can be potentially repaired and strengthening. So what we did is uh, we used a geo tag like that to assess the whole town, see that the yellow and the red and the green, you can see a mixture of it. We identified all those buildings, right? Then uh, again, with the MTPTC, uh, we developed the um, so-called repair manual. Because one thing we discover is the uh, it's really important to repair if it's possible. Because once you take the building down, it's very difficult to reconstruct. It takes a long time, takes more money. So it is much, much better as far as the uh, recovery process is concerned to repair, retrofit, strengthening. And also, rather than using the uh, new technologies or new things, try to use whatever available locally, whatever the uh, uh, local um, contractors or engineers are used to the technique, in this case, the confined masonry, right? But do it right. That is the, uh, the most important concept of it. So therefore, the, since we do notice that, um, that Haiti was never uh, expected the earthquake because last one, last big one's the 18, 1800s, right? You know, like uh, 1849 or something like that. So therefore, the, the earthquake is a far longer ago, such a lost memory. So we have to kind of re reinstall this whole risk of earthquake and how to go about them. But technique has to be simple. Uh, some, something simple can be adapted by the uh, local mason groups. So something like this. Essentially, you have to make a little bit. It used to be just using the, uh, the badly mixed concrete and uh, badly built uh, masonry unit and it has not much rebar or anything like that at all. However, just doing it right. For example, the, um, so what we've done here is we brought one master mason from San Diego, California, and he met with other master masons, about 40 to 50 of them in a Haiti. So it's, it's a essentially a concept of the uh, trained trainers to just do the right mix design, the amount of cement, sand, and water, and how to actually get the build correctly using a certain amount of steel. It's not much amount of steel, but having a little bit amount of right amount of rebound makes a huge difference in the performance. So this kind of technique actually get the taught that. Then this this about and uh, this uh, so-called instructors now they taught and trained around seven thousand masons after that. So that's what happened. But operation itself is fairly complex. Um, essentially, the, uh, this uh, uh, UNOPS uh, was involved pretty heavily, and um, um, uh, funding was come from a World Bank and USAID and many different agencies. And this is actually at the, under the uh, uh, Ministry of uh, Transportation and Public Works, MTPTs in Haiti, and they're the, actually the, uh, the D, uh, main agency of this. And, uh, and about key point was not done by the whole bunch of internationals. Key point is the hire the local mason group, local contractors, and overseen by the trained Haitian engineers. That was the key there. So, uh, for example, the uh, uh, damage assessment I was talking about. Initially, we had the, about a team of uh, maybe 20, 30 international engineers was involved. Uh, uh, as a part of the uh, um, there's a um, damage assessment about what uh, about any given moment there's about 250 Haitian engineers was there. At the very end, after one year, uh, there was only one international was involved because uh, uh, well the capacity was built and the Haitian engineers is uh, 
more than uh, adequate to do the job. So that's what happened there. I think that's such a key component is to build, not only build back better, but also build the capacity in the people. I think that's a really critical component of this kind of project. So this is a kind of a typical picture house of a yellow tag. In many cases, what we see there is a, so vertical loading carrying components was not compromised. However, the lateral force resisting elements, in this case, the infill was heavily cracked. So it's actually pretty dangerous. You know, this standing, because the vertical loading is okay, because they, they had columns, and they're undamaged carrying the loading. However, they lost a lot of the lateral force resisting capacity because the infill was gone. So what we do, replace the infill with a better system. So number one, basically remove the wall, shore the building first off. Then the infill back by Trade Masons Group in a better way. Something like this. Keep building up. It took the uh, usually the uh, typical houses like this. Uh, this is actually fairly small, but usually it took the uh, team of a mason consisted of about four people about one week to basically the, uh, reconstruct the house back in better condition, stronger condition, so be able to occupy it again. Um, it cost was around $2,000. Um, so it's definitely the uh, very cost effective way to put back the people in um, um, safer houses. Other solution they had at the time is what we call T-shelters, which means essentially transition uh, temporary shelters made of in many cases the uh, plastic or some little plywood or uh, some sometimes little uh, metal studs, stuff like that. Usually the cost of the temporary shelter is about $5,000 a piece. And the biggest thing is the money spent is money did not spend in Haiti. Money was spent in somewhere else, maybe somewhere in the United States, maybe somewhere in Europe, import those materials to the Haiti and uh, just international agencies and non-profits, they just built the thing to give to Haitians. Well, it's quick, easy way to provide a shelter per se but has no prolonged impact to the capacity, or it's not rebuilt in a uh, Haitian uh, commercial contractor capacity there. And also the money didn't stay. To actually reconstruct using the locally available material doing it better, to have the money stay in a community is a critical component of the faster recovery. Because after big disaster like this, people lose jobs, right? Because there's no jobs. So money is a, such a critical part of it. So doing this method, um, our company alone, this program alone, uh, repaired about 12,000 uh, buildings. And one thing we noticed that um, Haitian diaspora, they are uh, sending the money to the uh, people in uh, Port-au-Prince, right? They're, they're family members. They start hiring their own contractors, and they start to reconstruct their houses using our method, copying it. It was a fantastic. It just essentially that the public sector should contribute maybe 10 to 20 percent of a reconstruction components of it, but rest of it is financed and done by the Haitians by themselves. So today, when you go back to Haiti, you don't really see the, the much of a scar from the earthquake ever. And actually, I would I could say that Haiti today is bigger and better, safer as far as the structural engine components is concerned. It's different political things going on out there. As, as always, right? But as far as the structure engine is concerned, I think port prince is definitely better. And um, I'll show you some of the pictures I took uh, recently a little bit later. But uh, this just happens everywhere, you know? It doesn't have to be uh, Haiti, it just can be anywhere. Like, Indonesia 2018, it's a Palu earthquake, and uh, it's had it's incredible damage in this island. And it's a new school building, brand new, like one year old. It was a uh, used to be a three-story concrete, reinforced concrete structure. They're down to two levels, you know. Fortunately, school was not session, so it's, no one died from this thing. But uh, it could be an incredible thing could have happened to them. So it's an earthquake disaster. Something happens when you're not expected, you know. The, the reason that such a failure like this, this is the same picture I took in the Palu, and it's a government uh, public uh, building here under construction, and um, it looks pretty good actually, you got the good concrete finish and uh, I didn't see any 
spallingable concrete or anything like that. It looks nice, but what what in a sense like there's a lot of rebar. But once you kind of get into details, what you see on the right corner that is the uh, uh, ties, the hoops around the columns. And this is actually one of the most important components of a seismic engineering. How to actually uh, confine the vertical uh, rebars. That's a really important one. In this case, they almost have nothing. It's essentially smooth bar that need to be deformed bar to actually actually have a certain uh, bonding to the concrete. And also the hook, you see that there's a 90 degree little hook like that. It's going to pop out. It's going to pop under the seismic motion and it's going to crush the concrete. It has a, if this has the, uh, little, rather than a 90 degree hook like that, if it had a little longer and a little bend more up to 135 degree, it could have make a huge difference. So make it better and safer. It's usually very subtle, very subtle thing in earthquake uh, conditions. Little bent of a bar, little spacings, deform or plain bar, concrete mixture, how much is the cement water ratio, little things that, that makes a huge difference. Now, earthquake disaster is not only the places, the um, um, so-called the poor countries, like Haiti or New Zealand, but, uh, but New Zealand here, it's a, it's a beautiful country, as you, you all know, and this is picture taken right before the Christchurch, a Christchurch earthquake, this is a Christchurch picture here. It was a ton of about 400,000 people. It's beautiful. It's a beautiful heritage town. There, they had about 2,400 uh, concrete structures. And Monkey 6.3 happened in 2011. Here's the, um, here's what happened. They lost almost 90% uh, building stocks. Now, believe it or not, we said this actually met the intent of building code. Because building code only provides so-called life safety protections. They lost about 200 people, and most of the 200 people death come from a two order buildings collapse, right? So building the city didn't really survive through per se because there's a quite a bit of damage, so they have to take it down. But uh, it saved lives. So what this means? How this happened here? This is the 26-story uh, um, concrete structure, pretty new built in the uh, mid-1990s. Um, however, you can see a little tilt. At 11th level, few columns ruptured. Look like this. You see, no one died from this building. No one. No one died. Everybody was able to uh, walk out. But this building, there's no way you can repair or strengthen this one once it's become like that. So this is a total loss. That's how they lost this 2,200 buildings out of 2,400. Using the engineers, are they bad? The contracts is not really good. No, the New Zealand engineers probably one of the best earthquake structure engineers I know. They are most innovative one. Building code is as good as anywhere. The license system, education, education system, uh, quality control, uh, contractors and their capacity, bar none. But this is exactly what happened, right? So this is this is something that. Uh, First time we saw in modern cities, modern developed, developed cities, where the actual the meet the meet all the modern code, and once the big earthquake happens, could what could happen? Essentially, sure, we could save lives, but we could lose the whole city. You're gonna see a similar thing in um, near future, in LA, San Francisco, Tokyo, all those places we design for per minimum building code. You're going to see that the cities, you're going to see the buildings which cannot be used again or can be even repaired again. Because that's how the building code set up globally. This one is an Ecuador uh, earthquake in 2016. And again, this is a non ductile concrete failure. And just those buildings' failures are basically the same everywhere. There is no really boundary about it. It can be Ecuador, could it be anywhere, right? All the concrete structure is pretty dangerous. Anything built that prior to 1980s or mid 1980s, some countries even the 1990s, the, this concrete structure do not have the uh, good detailings per se for the rebar or concrete mixture we talked about, so become like that. But again, here's the uh, building tower. This is a brand new construction, engineered, financed by Canadian 
uh, companies, and this is in a, 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 a coastline of Ecuador, and you can see cracks. So building survived, no one died, but have this severe cracks and in infill walls. It's really shut down this building for a whole year. So obviously, case like this, no one can occupy that. Next picture, same thing. You know, again, there's no boundary of this damage, right? And this is a Nepal 2015. It's it's a engineer and constructed by the, the uh, excellent Indian contractors and um, engineers. And the uh, building code is good. The Indian building code, the Nepal building code they used. Um, this is one of the most luxurious apartment, high-rise apartments in uh, uh, Kathmandu. What, 2020 right now? So after five years, still unoccupied because it's Repairing this kind of nature is extremely difficult. Even that the structural damage was very limited to this building, but so much of a non-structural damage, it makes it extremely difficult to re repair and live back again. So what does the actual disaster resiliency mean? Uh, let me show you just how we define it. So horizontal axis you see time, and vertical axis is social indicators. Social indicator can be um, number of people live, or number of houses, or job, or GNP. It can be anything like that. So we keep living in a place, right? And suddenly disaster strikes. What happened? The social indicators drops to a certain degree. That's why we call direct loss. For example, uh, in Haiti, uh, affected area, we had we count about 430,000 buildings. And uh, about half of it, uh, uh, what damage? So it's a direct loss. So there's no usage to it. Then there's the uh, so-called downtime. What this is going to be uh, usually response, damage assessment, get the finance going, evacuation. So there's no active recovery, reconstruction things going on. It's completely going to stay the same. So downtime. By the way, the longer the downtime would be the chance of a recovery is getting less and less. Then after that, there is actually recovery process happens, or sometimes we go reconstruction. So that resiliency is really the, um, um, this bucket, right? The bucket itself, if the, the bucket is confined by this uh, um, downtime and reconstruction directly loss, that bucket, smaller the bucket would be, higher the resiliencies. So you can do three things to actually reduce this or increase the uh, resiliency or reduce the risk. One option could be reduce the direct loss. You know how to do that. Well, that's what engineering come in there. So you can uh, use the engineering to reinforce the building, so make the new buildings do better. You can reduce the direct loss. That's one option. Second option is reduce the downtime. You can set up the um, uh, damage assessment much more efficiently, or use a high, uh, nowadays there's a lot of different, you can, uh, you can do many different things you can do. 10 years ago, we didn't even, maybe it was remotely possible using the AI, using the satellite image. So right now, the disaster assessment could be much, much faster. Reconstruction components could be faster by the, uh, make sure the private sector was able to invest back. Like in Haiti, was actually a great example to able to have the Haitian diaspora to freely reinvest back to the country to re repair, reconstruct the houses of their family members. That's actually a really important part of what they were able to do. So if you can do things like that, actually the, uh, this graph shows the back to the same spot, but disaster can be an opportunity. Actually disaster can make the, uh, the social leakage even better than it was before. It's definitely impossible. And we've seen this in the COVID-1994 earthquake. Now, actually, 1995, sorry, 1995 the, uh, uh, event, that particular case is the Kobe was reconstructed really fast because the way the Japanese government set up the zoning process and so on to make the, uh, the investment easier and better, faster. So Kobe was reconstructed within uh, almost three, four years, and it's definitely the, uh, the safer and the better today, stronger today. And uh, as I said, said before, Haiti, Haiti is, believe it or not, it actually it's better, stronger than it was before. And... Uh, you know, within five years, they actually reconstruct almost 200,000 buildings out there. So, let's see how we can deal with it. So, how we can reduce the direct loss components of it.
This is the engine part of it, right? So let's see the, uh, the one more graph here. Performance is a horizontal axis, and performance is how much, say, earthquake performance we measure based on how much building moves or displacement we call, and vertical axis number of buildings. So if the earthquake happens, and there's a 100 buildings per se, so it doesn't meet the code, okay? It doesn't mean that 100% of buildings collapse. Some buildings actually perform okay, which means um, we will less or displacement higher, may have some collapse. Certain building stock meets the code. What does that mean? It will shift the curve to the a little more narrower. So shift to the, the less displacement or less damage, and also the uh, actual certainty get higher, so therefore band get narrower. But you can better than the code, right? For example, there's technique you can, you can use the uh, viscous damping devices or energy dissipators to actually absorb a certain energy. What could happen? Well, again, same thing. You're going to see that the shift to the less damage index and it has the uh, much narrow band. And one of the best solutions out there is the base isolations, which is the uh, essentially elongation of period of a building by the, you can say, I don't know, little rollers underneath the building per se, but it's not rollers, but or something like that, right? It could be made of the uh, uh, lead core uh, rubber isolators or friction pendulum isolators. There's many different products out there. But essentially, the whole concept is the uh, isolate the building from a ground movement below. So when you do things like that, and uh, then a band get even narrower and our performance get better and better. So there's definitely the uh, so-called known code to base isolation. There's different uh, technique to deal with this thing. But as you can see, there's no 100% safe buildings out there, right? Even using the isolators, there's certain probability, in a sense, has a much more damage or less damage. You can see that so-called um, uh, deviation of it. What about cost? Let's say the um, um, first uh, known code is to say cost is 100. And what the meet the code means? It really doesn't cost that much. I'm talking about subtle things, right? We talked about the uh, uh, cement and the water mixture ratio, or we talked about the, uh, um, the hoop or tie Reinforcement have a high basis. So, so cost comparison between known code and code is almost negligible. So there's a myth out there to form the building code is very expensive. That's not so true at all whatsoever. That's, uh, it's definitely a myth there. And that's not something you have out there. Just doing that the right capacity of laborers and contractors and knowledge base and um, having the, the right materials, I think it makes a huge difference out there. Even using dampers. Usually, our experience seen at about a couple percentage increase in construction cost. So you can see the uh, uh, just having the uh, code building minimum, which you saw what could happen to those buildings, but adding dampers, just so you can really narrow the band and you can definitely uh, reduce the uh, damage. Doesn't cost much at all. But once it comes to base isolation, usually costly. Usually, uh, we see somewhere between the five to ten percent addition to the. Uh, uh, construction cost itself. Now, this is the kind of reason, besides the Japan, a base isolation is not widely used for normal buildings, the commercial buildings. Japan case is different. There are over 10,000 buildings being isolated out there. The reason is uh, because uh, uh, Kobe earthquake in 95 proves the uh, base isolation buildings perform really well. So public see the, uh, understand the, uh, the effectiveness of this base isolation building to protect their investment assets or place they live. So there's a public knowledge exists. And Japanese developers, they did it. They are doing a great job. If you take Japanese subway, you can see the advertisement showing you that this apartment is base isolated. It's a safe building you buy. And you can actually charge a premium for it. So it's definitely the uh, combination of the um, uh, knowledge in the public and also the um, you know uh, well they have a frequent earthquake they almost have a, every five years they have a pretty major earthquakes in Japanese cities right so constant reminder of risk and also the commercial sector developers to actually invest the marketing component that makes the Japan is the most base I said 
countries in the world. It's definitely the uh, one of the really best technique. It's not for every single site. So obviously, base isolation is great for the hard soil or rock site. But once it becomes super soft site, it's not particularly great sometimes. So, but you got to be careful about that. But it's definitely a great solution. Now, I'm going to show you the one example. This building is uh, located in California. It's uh, uh, built in the 1960s and the reinforced concrete structures. And you can imagine the reinforced concrete structures in the 1960s. It's what we call non ductile concrete structure. It's very dangerous types. You know, there's no seismic reinforcement, anything like that. Plus, on the ground floor, there was a soft story. Soft story is uh, something that um, makes this type of building extremely dangerous. Combination of non ductility and a soft story, which means the essentially the uh, so ground floor moves because higher uh, floor height usually moves more than any other floors. That will have a concentration of the damage. And if it's non ductility going on, that's where the collapse happens. So probably the collapse of this kind of building exceeding about 30% or higher in a major earthquake event. So what we do? So this case is the um, uh, pretty challenging, right? It's an occupied building and a commercial building, so mine is pretty limited. And but uh, one thing the uh, owner of this building noticed that is the uh, there was damage in Napa earthquake a couple of years ago, and uh, they're hiring a, they're um, paying a, quite a bit of earthquake insurance, almost the um, I think there's something like a three hundred fifty thousand dollars US per year for earthquake insurance itself for this uh, uh, twin towers. And so it was actually at the commercially very uh, difficult for them. And but uh, the owner is, is on this building, and what they want to do is they have a lot of uh, capital sitting there. They want to self finance um, so called insurance. Uh, for, uh, they want to basically self, self insure this building, and they, have a, they think they have enough capital to sit there to basically deal with it. But however, their bank requires them to buy the insurance, right? So they go, their question is can we just make this building better? So therefore, the, the bank don't have to force them to buy the insurance, but we're going to re in, we, they, are they going to uh, self-insure anyway? Is there any way to doing it? But they have a limited amount of money. So basically, what we decide to do is, oh, sorry, yeah. we put the uh, fluid viscous dampers only at the ground level. It's right there. Cost of someone between the five hundred thousand to that was like seven hundred thousand dollars range. So someone right. And uh, it's about 20% of the dampening at the ground level. And this results of it. So what you're going to see here is uh, the building in the front is uh, undamped before. And when the backside is damped, you can see those uh, viscous dampers at the ground level. Just only eight locations, by the way. It made a huge difference. So you can visually see it. Almost cut down the, the drift or displacement at the ground floor by the fact of a two. So using damping devices, uh, be able to keep everything remain elastic per se. Cost of seven hundred thousand dollars. That's two years of insurance. It's a two years payback time, right? So for this, the owner of building, there's no burden for them. Building is much better, much safer, because in the event of major earthquake, um, building remain elastic, which means damage is really limited. And also at the same time, yet they can save thirty fifty thousand dollars per year for insurance. They have their own money sets into it. So that's the one of the best practices I saw. And here's what the uh, dampers look like. You see, structure inching can be very sexy. It's nice, isn't it? It's beautiful. Back in Haiti, that's me. And um, I was uh, one day driving around the, uh, this fairly poor neighborhood. Actually, it's a very poor neighborhood. It's a, a, a informal setups. Uh, housing in the area. And I was driving through and uh, I saw this construction. And they're looking really good, you know. They got, uh, you see the hooks and all kind of things going on. And I went up there. And um, that contractor you just saw, he was actually the uh, one of the uh, masons we trained 10 years ago. And can you imagine? And I met him, right? And he got the little commercial uh, contractor business going on. He was a small crew of four people. Now he with the serious, like, you know, contracted things going on, right? But he's using the full ACI 318 confirmed details. 
I was so proud of it. You know, I mean, this is after 10 years, man, he just fallen in the exact place should it be. This is called capacity building, you know. And there's no one enforcing this, by the way. You know, there's no permit system or anything like that in Haiti right now. But they just see that this is how they do it. And not only this particular building, we saw, we saw that many of our small houses, they're building around the area. And we started doing uh, some research. We counted about 70% of our buildings has the right so-called uh, uh, tire reinforcement details, 70% of it. And we started asking some of Masons, how did you learn this? Or, or you, know, you must learn from, from me, right? You know? They go, no, we don't know you. Who the hell are you? You know, this is how to do those things. I said, wow, really? So I asked him, well, were you in Port of Princeton back in 2010? Somebody else trained you. No, no, I'm from somewhere else. But what happened here is the, uh, the, this whole practice of the right reinforcement per se become norm of a profession. Remember, our operation around, alone trained 7,000 masons and many different uh, companies all trained thousands, thousands of them. So once the, this magnitude of a capacity building like that happens in a very short amount of time, you can really change the uh, um, so-called standard of practice per se, and that become memory of a profession. And I think that's a, such a critical part of it. So I know that people talk about Haiti was a bad example of a re recovery and all the stuff. Well, I see that evidence is out there a little bit differently. Haiti's buildings. This is a UNESCO registered historical building called Garibatak in Kathmandu. And the earthquake destroyed a country, as I, as I said, lost almost 10,000 people. And we found this building like this. This is a picture taken around 2016, about one year after. So this is a, really the center of this town. Um, this is Daba Square in the Kathmandu. And this is one of the most prominent buildings, as, as you can imagine. This is a used to be building, um, received the uh, uh, foreign uh, ambassadors and dignitaries to this building. That's what the um, uh, whole building's usage has got a huge heritage of it, and it's abandoned. And there's no hope. They don't know what to do about it. So basically what we did is the, uh, um, we have a, a non-profit called Miyamoto Global Disaster Relief. We got funded about the uh, 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 American Embassy, U.S. Embassy, and their intent is they want to restore this thing. So what we did is we activate our Italian engineers because Italians man they understand they understand yet how to deal with this brick and a mortar and a wood you know we don't have that much in California right so we need the help so they come up to a very ingenious approach it's I mean, being a UNESCO heritage building you cannot use the uh, uh, material which is not original one so we have to use brick and some lime mud, wood, some a little bit of a steel, not much, that kind of things, you know, that's what we have to use. And so what happened here is the, uh, some very interesting approach. So that in a, at the roof diaphragm, it provides a wood, almost like a um, uh, collector we go, or the, uh, the horizontal diaphragm along the band of it. So it's provided a really integrity of this whole system. And Walls are connected by the steel rods. Actually, it's connected by no steel rods. I'm sorry. It's connected by the heavy wood truss, which is the original version of it, reinforced, connected the walls together from front to back. The provide the, that type of integrity is a really critical component of a stabilized this kind of building. And they noticed the the corner is the, the really important part of it. That will provide the seismic so called rich strain part of it. So embedded into the uh, steel rod, pretension steel rod into the brick system, you can see it. And that's how it should be stored. This is a cost $700,000 US. And uh, it's uh, fully funded by US Embassy. And this is what it looked like um, a couple of years ago. It's uh, it's amazing. It's the uh, it's really big, it's a symbol of this country, and uh, we really felt this particular building is really the uh, 
uh, provide the hope and direction to the after this this diversity this earthquake in uh, Nepal in 2015, and this all again done by the uh, uh, combination of uh, our Italian engineers, our Nepali engineers, and masons from Nepal. So it's all done by locally. That's actually really, again, critical part of it, reconstruction. So we talked about the uh, how to reduce the uh, uh, direct loss. Now, how we can reduce the downtime fast. So some of the things uh, you can do is uh, obviously the prepare the uh, earthquake beforehand. Right, we talk about in uh, Haiti, we have to train, to develop the train, get all the Haitian engineers, so that takes a long time. So there's downtimes get longer. So we have a program with the US aid in uh, many different countries, and how we can actually get, enhance the uh, uh, recovery policies, recovery policies such as such as the um, um, rapid damage assessment, assembled teams, and their actual. Uh, legal uh, means to be able to do that or financial means to do that and debris management about the how to remove debris what can be removed what's not and then what to uh, uh, bring to things like that makes a huge difference it seems pretty simple stuff but uh, this thing kind of thing if you've been thinking about in uh, public agencies or certain policies or certain methodologies exist that will make a huge impact and uh, urban search and rescue team training components Stuff like that. So those are essentially the things government can do, or even private sector can do this in their own domain to make a huge impact in response time. Again, you can reduce the response time. You can definitely increase the resiliency, as you saw in a little picture. And uh, to all this thing, some of the cities we go, there is no per se earthquake. For example, San San Jose, uh, Costa Rica, they they have earthquake, there was earthquake, but there's this distance memory of it. So we need to actually articulate what does a disaster look like in terms of the uh, building damage, destruction, and amount of red tag, yellow tag, green tag, and also the um, uh, how many people die potentially, injury, stuff like that. Because once you articulate those things, you can really move the government, public sector to do something about it. So that was the whole system like that. So we use the uh, uh, Hazard data, we use the uh, facility data and also building exposure data to combine that, run the uh, uh, simulation. About 10,000 of combination simulation to come up to building damage, facilities, and debris amounts. Then we create a map like this one and showing that uh, some articulation of the tables, like you know how many red tags building, in this case, almost 26% of a uh, uh, building stock can be damaged, fatality up to 3,000 people. In the San Jose, and it's showing the map like this one to basically the, uh, convey the message essentially. So, as we talk about building, building damage system is known. Can we do something faster and better today? Yes, we can. Uh, because people need an engine assessment, and only engine assessment, though, actually need to understand repair cost as fast as possible. You can wait for one year, six months, even two weeks. Need now. So basically, what we have done there is uh, we combined a partner company called I Built to build this app system, which can the uh, collect the uh, information very rapidly by the even homeowners about what kind of damage is, what's not. Then remotely, we can actually figure it out same day. Not only red tag, yellow tag, green tag, but also the, the quantity, quantify the um, um, repair. Uh, material and also cost. That's actually very important, as you can see here. Okay, so damage assessment. When I go there, uh, personally, I probably assess like a thousand, about, around two thousand buildings. But even me, I'm looking at buildings like this. Sometimes I don't know what those cracks means, you know. By the way, because I don't have X-ray vision, and um, there's a whole bunch of heating things going on. This building picture, damage picture I took. Well, you know, some certain damage exists. And some people say red could be something yellow. It's, you could be anywhere, really. You know, it depends on engine judgment. It's very subjective about it. So when the judgment is subjective, it tends to become very conservative. That's how engineers are, right? That's how we are. So we tend to become put some yellow tag if it's even little cracks because we don't know. We don't be liable. 
or if the uh, crack is even bigger, we put red tagging people to move away from that, which is uh, okay to put the safety and all that. But really, the problem is the uh, it's uh, it will reduce the so-called or increase the um, uh, prolong the uh, um, downtime. So, about many things we can do today. Uh, again, we partner with a company called Global Seismic Data. It's a little accelerator, so you can put it in the building. And um, you can see the uh, big, uh, well, it's a pretty cheap unit, so $200, actually. And you can put in things like that. You can actually measure the uh, acceleration as the uh, earth is going. Earthquake happens. And then instantly go to cloud. So once we have that kind of data, you know, knowing the acceleration and all that, we can really judge with the red, yellow, green really fast. And we can do it at the much more accurate engine. This is not a subject judgment. Especially that the, if the um, building's model prior to the earthquake, just putting the, the input motion into it, putting the actual acceleration, you can match the uh, what happened to the building. So from connection to connection, from beam to beam to column to column, we know exactly what the demand capacity ratio would look like. So we can have much more accurate engine judgment. So there's a lot of technology today to make a just huge impact and um, not only make a structure safer and better performance, but also reduce the response time and the fast enough the time. I think things like this is so critical to protect our cities and our societies. Thank you very much. Okay, Kit. <laughs> uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Kit, for such a great presentation. Actually, can I hear from our audience, appreciate the use of local materials and workforce, and NIROC, like your definition of resilience. Now, we are going to take questions from the audience. The first question is from Yao. He is from a region that is not located in a seismic zone. And he asks, how important do you think is to formulate a systematic seismic design in buildings and highway highway structures, I assume even if they are located, they are not located in a high seismic zone. Well, I think the, uh, I mean, how? Well, again, the, uh, um, you know, as you see in the past earthquake zone, earthquake happens pretty much place the way that the no one's expected it happens. With Kobe earthquake in 1994, 1995, Kobe people thought, oh, uh, uh, Kobe earthquake people thought it was not, before 95, people didn't think it was an earthquake area. It's more like a flood area, that's what I'm thinking. Northridge in LA was basically some kind of thing, you know? And uh, Christchurch yes. also was uh, considered to be a moderate seismic area. So it's just no one knows what's going to happen to you, right? But providing seismic safety, a really simple thing. You know, having a little reba confinement, spacings, you know, having a little hooks or not hooks. It just, it's a good engine practice. It doesn't add cost, almost nothing. I think things like that, you know, can be done for anything from our buildings to highway system to have things about them. Okay. Now, Enes asked us, which was the damage assessment methodology that you used in Haiti? And which methodology will, will you recommend to use for the building damage assessment? Yeah, we use a technique called ATC20. That's a Develop Applies Technology Council. And it's a pretty much US system. Now, we use the main country systems in the past, from a Japan system to everything, right? I personally like the ATC20 system because it's very simple. It's a, it's a simple system to identify red, yellow, green, and it depends on the, the red means that it's an imminent collapse potential because the vertical loading carrying capacity is compromised or about to compromise. And uh, yellow is the um, a little less degree, and about lateral force resistance system compromise could be dangerous and stuff like that. So it's a very simple way to actually capture it rapidly, you know, really fast. That's actually a really important part of it. So I do like AT Stony. And uh, but as I said, you know, using AT Stony, there is a lot of a subject to judgment from engineering engineers. So that's the, the definitely the so-called con components of that, you know. Uh, another oh. question: Ruben, ask you, Kit, 
to please elaborate on the seismic response of natural materials such as hempcrete, bamboo, cob, and uh, rammed earth. In particular, he asks he ask you if it will be good to know if you have any comments on how these materials, natural materials, may be used in combination in seismic design. Oh yeah, most definitely. I think a bamboo can be a really good one. And uh, there's some certain uh, technique available to actually use a bamboo as a, a reinforcement of a brick buildings. Um, actually, the, you know, if you go to the uh, uh, Ecuador, uh, Colombia, and uh, Colombia. for hun hundreds of uh, uh, years, the uh, uh, people use actually bamboo to reinforce the the brick building. Brick buildings, and some of it I, I saw the buried structure by the uh, uh, volcano for several hundred years ago. Those actually that performed really well. I saw a lot of ductile kind of failures, you know. And uh, Indonesia, uh, uh, some certain technique is a bamboo. So the Colombia too to actually the, the retrofit the uh, uh, buildings. That's the only problems of that that kind of bamboo system is. Uh, deterioration of it, you know, that's a, definitely an issue. But it's definitely that provided a good um, uh, technique. I agree. I agree. I agree with you, especially in Colombia after the earthquake of the uh, after the earthquake in 1999, the structures uh, building bamboo uh, suffered any damage, uh, suffered no damage, oh, yeah. while the structures in concrete, the several of them collapsed. So I agree with the bamboo. Well, the other question yeah, from our... Uh, but let me kind of add to that though. I, I saw something in the uh, uh, Philippines. Uh, there was an earthquake in one island where the many of us so called non-confirming concrete structures are damaged really badly, right? And and um, uh, none of the wood construction or bamboo construction obviously no damage at all because the uh, earthquake doesn't even touch those things. But once come, there's a hurricane, you want to happen a month after. Guess what? All the concrete buildings survived, but however, the, the all of the wood construction is different parts of the island. It's completely gone, right? So it just uh, depends on which uh, evil you're kind of facing. But you can make a uh, um, you know concrete structures to be earthquake resilient and hurricane resilient, and no problems. And same thing applied to the wood construction also. Okay. The next question is, you have presented the relative cost for four types of new construction, uh, non-code, code, dampers, base, isolation. Do you have comparison cost for retrofitting the same construction? Yeah, retrofit. Um, again, there's a myth about retrofit is really expensive. It is true in a sense that if you try to make the building to every single system in the building to meet the code, current code, yes, it become really expensive. And it's almost uh, cost prohibited. Something California tried to do here, we tried to make the hospital buildings, older hospital buildings to meet the code or everything about it. That's almost unaffordable. It just, uh, that because of that program go really slow. But that one example I showed up to you, but However, you know, if you try to make like a more pinpoint approach, like a surgical approach about the identified deficiencies, that particular case that we identified the soft story, and address that, it can be really, really cost effective. For example, California, in LA, there is about 13,000 apartment buildings considered to be really dangerous because there's what we call tuck under parking. There is the uh, soft story condition created by this parking lot in underneath about wood apartment buildings and many of those collapsed in the past events, right? And uh, and uh, basically providing that is a really critical critical part. And so that particular program basically ad particularly just addressed that soft story or tuck under parking only. So it make a really affordable program and it usually costs uh, hundred thousand, two hundred thousand dollars for a fairly large scale of apartment. So very affordable condition for the apartments like that. So it's become a really successful program in uh, California in LA. Okay. So cost well, can be cost can be you can say average if you do right compared to the total cost. In some cases I see less, you know, a couple percentage, five percent, 
maybe maximum 10%, something like that, you, 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 you probably see. So it's definitely retrofit is a much more cost effective than a, mm -hmm. a replacement whole building system. That's for sure. Usually, World Bank use a 40% value yeah. as the uh, either replace or retrofit for the uh, like hospitals and schools. Okay, we have another question this time from a woman, Menia. She asked, with respect to the relative cost you present of a non-code and a code building, would you say that such conclusion is widely applicable around the world or it is rather restricted to certain regions? No, it's a pretty much applicable for everywhere because um, essentially, like, you know, I mean, almost like a whole world is built almost the exact same way. It's a, uh, you know, it's almost 89% of buildings out there you see is where the wood is not available. The uh, concrete uh, confined masonry construction, you know, bricks confined by the, some concrete. That's it, how most of the world is built like that from houses to high rise buildings. And to make those buildings safer, having that right mixture of a motor and a built, you know, uh, much more disciplined way for those bricks to, you know, stuck together, have the confined rebar to be right configuration. Most of the case, people have a right amount, just have the right configuration or details, you know. So therefore, the, the cost is more like a, more like a, rather than a material, more like a labor time. And labor times uh, usually get um, um, uh, more cost effective in the development uh, context, you know. So the cost increase is a pretty minimum. That's, that's our experience. Okay. Um, uh, uh, Pranap asked no, ask us, uh, ask you, have you ever used shake table testing to study, or, uh, to study the rehabilitation or restoration techniques? techniques adopted by you? If yes, how have you scaled the result to an actual building? Well, the uh, um, uh, my PhD from uh, um, the uh, uh, Tokyo Institute of Technology, and we collaborate quite a bit of work, and uh, my PhD wasn't actually uh, uh, damping devices. So we actually, the uh, um, to, we actually destroy the dampers for maximum velocity. See so how actually dampers uh, behaves. It's done actually uh, uh, by uh, in the U.S. Then a particular result is that to you have a whole bunch of computer simulations. And after the different researchers actually used the full scale model of a, a steel construction using dampers to update the failures in uh, um, the Kobe uh, shaking table. Full scale, so it's definitely the, there are plenty of the so-called testing shaking table results out there, you know. But as the engineer, basically, yet we collaborate with the researchers and engineers like that to do that. And uh, University of Tokyo, there's a, a wonderful uh, lab, uh, Megro Lab. They done a ton of a testing shake table test for the reinforcement of the uh, uh, small brick houses, and they use the many technologies built up. Some cases they use actually paint the fiber reinforced paint actually to make the, those buildings stronger, or they go PP band that's actually plastic band actually wrap around the building which you can buy really cheaply in any, any country. Uh, it's a pretty amazing thing they do, or more or more traditional like uh, a wire mesh with a you know plaster approach and stuff like that. So yes, there are a lot of uh, full scale testing going on um, in uh, many parts of the uh, uh, world. Okay. Juan Sandoval from Colombia asked uh, you, uh, do you think we should include in our Latin American code the concept of level of performance focused on saving life? life? Saving lives? I think I know the guy, by the way, who asked me a question. You <laughs> should know that. Yeah. But, uh, no, I, yeah, I, I think so. I think uh, because I just look in the, uh, no, I do it. I agree with one. I mean, um, um, because I mean, you know, you, you sort of hate it, right? I mean, it, we lost uh, three hundred thousand people, and some of the, uh, the uh, cities we go in uh, Latin America, so we do risk study. You s we see a death of a huge amount, you know, tens of thousands of people, you know, 
and you saw it in Nepal. We lost 10,000 people. I mean, it was Saturday afternoon earthquake. It's actually destroyed 600,000 people, uh, 600,000 buildings, 7,000 schools included, right? It's such a low death ratio because it was happened to be middle of a Saturday afternoon. People kind of out about it. If that's hap if that has happened eight hours before or after, you would have probably seen a million death out there. You would have lost uh, hundreds, hundreds of thousands of students probably died there. So it's definitely get to focus on the uh, life safety components. A first step is a really critical one. I think that would be something that um, uh, really want to focus on first. You know, especially the houses. Schools, you know, made of brick and older concrete structures. Those are so dangerous. They're essentially death boxes, you know. And uh, as we talked about, uh, retrofit is cost effective. It's just definitely not possible to do that. So there's a big myth about those retrofit is expensive. It's completely not true. And uh, I think that's really critical to do, to do that. I mean, Sichuan earthquake in 2008. I was there. I saw all those big gigantic schools. Uh, which contained a thousands, thousand students, they collapsed like a pancakes, you know, in uh, Sichuan. And one school I was there, I know it's uh, buried about 2,000 kids in there. So it's definitely there's a need to. And after China uh, definitely changed the uh, uh, whole philosophy of the school construction, and I think they are also retrofitting all the schools, too, by the way. So they, they learn the really painful lessons, you know. So I think that the world don't have to learn, re relearn those lessons at all. I think. Lessons enough now. I think time to act. That, that's how I how I look at it. So I I do agree with one. Thanks for the question. Mm. <laughs> okay. Uh, Nido, ask it, you if there is any quantified process of material property of bamboo or traditional construction material. How can those traditional construction material be analyzed in numerical or structural models? Um. Bamboo, like, um, for example, there is the very developed bamboo industry in, say, Colombia. I mean, mm -hmm. Colombia is, is probably one of the most advanced form. You see the uh, beautiful overpass built purely by bamboo. You see the beautiful museum built by bamboo. It's just beautiful construction. Yes. So mm -hmm. as far as the bamboo technology is concerned, I think Colombia is probably the most advanced one. And... Um, so maybe one son of all can answer the question better than I can. <laughs> but uh, uh -huh. um, but also you see that the place like Bali in, in uh, Indonesia, there's beautiful bamboo constructions. It's it's, it's uh, obviously as far as the earthquake is concerned, bamboo is definitely a great um, material to use in that. You know, and actually we uh, yep. tried to introduce the bamboo technology from Colombia to uh, Ecuador uh, last year based on the US USA programs. And um, it's bamboo is very you know it's uh, it for many countries it's easy to get you know it's available strong durable yes. if it's done right it, it it will last a long long time so it's definitely the good good approach to doing that but also you know same time you know uh, brick and a mortar and the blocks you know cement it can you know that that's become almost like a locally available material now you know for many parts of the world and you can make that very safe very beautiful buildings using that. Bricks, you know, yes. concrete unit, cement, mm -hmm. you know. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Uh, Panayotis asked, which is ask, which is the best way to prevent out of of plane failure of the infield walls during an earthquake? In plane failures, how do you? Uh, exactly. What's the uh, best way to? Uh, Prevent out. Uh, uh, in fill walls. In fill walls. I think walls. it's a really important part. It's just, uh, yeah, I think it's uh, for the infill walls on a confined a mainstream. I think uh, having a, a good plaster makes a huge difference. And um, uh, for the Nepal, for the reconstruction of some of the uh, those apartments got damaged, we specified that the well, uh, wire mesh embedded into the uh, uh, plaster over that brick. Uh, that actually makes a big difference. Uh, I think uh, having a uh, wired mesh in the plaster over the, the brick, that's actually a good technique. And I saw the uh, uh, similar things was used in um, uh, Mexico um, after 1985 event. And uh, the last earthquake, last uh, earthquake that, that, that actually made it, made it good, you know. So uh -huh. performed well, put it this way. So to me, that would be probably a good way to... Uh, 
really reduce or reduce the damage index in the info or just having a don't have to be a big um wet wire just at the very thin wet wire do do the do the nice job a nice plaster job you know by the way i do like the info wars. i mean before nepal mm -hmm. er, earthquake i thought info wars is a bad idea have a reinforced concrete have a just a purely have a reinforced concrete columns and beams what we call special you know concrete moment frames to basically take mm -hmm. the load and deform that and absorb the energy but uh, seeing the, how the infill walls fails, and uh, some of the buildings in Nepal are the high-rise buildings now, so those infill walls performed really well in a sense that cause a lot of cracks and absorb a lot of energy, you know? And mm -hmm. we probably assessed at least a couple of dozens of these high-rise apartments there and the heavily damaged ones. We didn't see the much of a structural damage at all because of the, uh, those infill walls took a lot of loads, you know? And but if you don't have an infill walls, what would happen? Well, maybe it's less they fill yeah. by the metal studs. That's maybe typical construction in, say, California may do. What, what, what the energy is taken by? Energy taken by the actual, actual concrete columns, beams, you know. And design philosophy is that they essentially beams to yield, you know, cracks and then go don't go back to a neutral start uh, place. So that's how design philosophy is that energy absorption done by the, the structural elements. Can you fix that? Probably not. So if the Nepal building was built in, say, say per California standard, probably will not be able to fix the thing because so much of yielding going on in the beam elements, you know, it'd be very difficult now. So I think that the question is why do you want to have, a, have a energy dissipation? Do you have an energy dissipation in a gravity loading carrying elements like that or somewhere else? I think that that's something that the engineers, we have to really seriously think about it. You know, you, uh, otherwise we, we'd be designing a lot of our buildings were leaned and never come back to neutral spot. That's basically the, what what is the building code is about, you know. And uh, mm -hmm. in the U.S., design philosophy of a high-rise buildings is that uh, if the big earthquake happens, you're allowed to have a permanent tilt, per se, or uh, deformation of a 1% or so and a big event. That's a big, that's 1%. I mean... Would you buy that kind of apartment for a million bucks? I'll say no, not really. I mean, uh, I think uh, I think society expect much more than uh, just life safety in these uh, uh, developed countries. You know, it's much more than that. Mm -hmm. And I think that we need to really think about what what the society's demand is. It's we need to increase the resiliency. Sure, our code is a really you know built developed in 1960s and 70s where that life safety is such a key component of it. But we got to go much beyond it today. And there's a means to doing that. There's technology to doing that. So there's no more excuse about it. Okay. Well, coming back to the topic of bamboo, I just remember the name of the architect who have designed, who has designed very nice structures in bamboo, Simon Belles. And I took the opportunity. I yeah, took the opportunity. That's right. Exactly, to invite uh, the audience to visit the coffee park in Colombia to see wonderful structures made on bamboo. Now, uh, yeah, that's so true. I mean, that's amazing, amazing architecture. You know, I must say that's incredible. Yes. And uh, the next question is from Pranap: Is have you found flat slab systems more susceptible to earthquake damage compared to other structural systems? Well, I know that they used to, and I think changing now, the Indian code allowed to use the flat uh, reinforced concrete casting plate slab and support the column to be being a part of the lateral force resistance systems. And this this was prohibited by the uh, 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 both the U.S. and Japan code for a couple of de maybe 30, 40 years now. It's um it's a very dangerous uh, technique, I must say. Because you're going to cause the, uh, it's just the, uh, those slabs, it can be punctured really quickly. And it doesn't have enough the, um, uh, ductility per se, or, uh, you know, to basically carry the loadings. So, uh, it's Indian code is changing now to basically the, to not have it at the flat slab only to support the lateral force resistant systems. And, uh, I, in my opinion, that's a very dangerous way to de deal with the seismic forces. You know, should I have a certain, beam there don't have to be everywhere by the way you can have a flat slab and you could have a lateral force resistance system separately 
like uh, for example, uh, many of uh, uh, high-rise buildings built that way in LA or San Francisco have a very strong core walls and flat, flat systems out there, which perform just fine. That's good because it has a very distinct uh, uh, rigid system. Or having a having a moment frame systems and have a flat flat slab, which is not even use a flat slab alone. That's not a really good practice. The main core is that. Okay. Uh, one of the, our last question is from Professor Georgopoulos. Uh, he congratulated you for the presentation, and he said, "Well, he said European uh, Europeans claim that Eurocode 8 Part 3 assessment and retrofitting of building is the best code in the world. What is your view?" <laughs> if I ask my Italian engineers, they will tell me the exact same thing. So I have no argument on that one. <laughs> I, I think that the uh, building code is the uh, codes, you know, uh, American system is different, Japanese system is different, European system is different. Those are three, like, a main kind of a source code, and also a UK code. And uh, those are kind of basis of, uh, that's a, like, a four, you know, three, four major building codes up there. And... Um, I think basically philosophy is kind of similar, you know, about ductility and stuff like that. There's not much deviation between two. There's an approach that may be different. And some of them are a little more complicated than others, you know, but end up the similar kind of thing. But um, uh, I think that the, all the codes and all approach, all the assessment system is there's nothing wrong with it. You know, they're good. But it depends on okay. which, which, uh, which, which office I'm asking about those things, but anyway. <laughs> I think this is our last question is from yes. Alessandro Di Cesare. He says he is Italian from L'Aquila. They have a devastating earthquake in 2009, and the main issue was doing the assessment because the access to the building was not safe. Then he believes that the safety should come, bef should come, should come first, and building, evacuate, and building should be evacuated until, until the assessment until this, uh, before before the assessment. So what is the approach or what is your opinion about that? Oh yeah, most definitely. I mean, um, uh, if there's any kind of damage, uh, that needs to be assessed by the engineer before before uh, occupy the building. You know, I think that's a really critical. And because some of the damage that people see, that no engineer see, Sometimes they see the little cracks and think that's a big deal, which is potentially a big deal. Some of our cracks in the columns can be fatal. Or some say so dangerous can go in, but just the superficial architectural you know, failures of plastic cracks doesn't affect anything, right? So you really need to have engineers to really assess those buildings. That's why the so-called rapid assessment is really critical. So people can really, public can see if the building they're occupying or working is safe or, or dangerous. So a rapid assessment system is the most critical component of an earthquake response, you know, right after the urban search and, search and rescue team and uh, medical support. Okay. Which code standard do you usually adopt in making a structural strengthening, strengthening and retrofitting of buildings due to seismic events? ATC40, ASCE41, GSAA, uh, 202? Which code do you usually adopt? Generally speaking, uh, I use a physics book. <laughs> That's actually a better approach, you know, because you, you see the buildings, which is the um, made hundreds of years ago or 300 years ago, right? Or it doesn't read <laughs> code or nothing of a nature. So using the physics to understand that the actual really behavior of the um, building when a certain seismic hazard or event then you start looking at the displacement and how actually the soil structure interaction going on and uh, what does the permanent deformation look like? What is the probability of certain things happen to it? So use the physics to really understand that concept first, you know? Then we check against some different guidelines and codes. But personally, I think AC41 is very organized and uh, very, um, uh, in a way, the uh, very organized way to really use the physics book in a rapid way. So, so it just depends on again, you know, from from a country office, country offices, you know, from a, I mean, Turkish office to Italian office to you know, New Zealand office to us, we, everybody has different guidelines. 
but uh, um, so since I'm based in LA, I do use the AC41. Doesn't mean it's better, but that's what I use. <laughs> and uh, but most important thing is a physics book. Physics is the same. Doesn't matter if it's in New Zealand or US or Mars, right? So when you look at how to make matters, you get used to physics book. You know, it's not about the code. It's about about the, the structural uh, performance and probably what could happen.